Shiva, like if I would want to start with Kubernetes, what what do you think would be the uh, things I would need to focus on when I start off? Okay. So typically when you think about learning Kubernetes, there are two aspects of it. Like, are you a developer who is trying to deploy your application on Kubernetes? Are you a uh, administrator who wants to set up the cluster and manage the resources now? So assuming you are not, we are not talking about the uh, administration side of things. Uh, from uh, a developer point of view, uh, first we need to understand the Kubernetes primitives, like what is pod, what is replica set, what is service, what is the deployment, and what each uh, kind of object is responsible for. Uh, why not just use pods? Uh, you can spin up pod and then you can access it, but why you want to go with the deployment? What is the role of a replica set? So understanding these primitives is very uh, critical to uh, use Kubernetes effectively. And then uh, a little bit more is kind of a, a ingress rules and how you route uh, from a domain uh, URL to your parts. Uh, how do you route the traffic? So, uh, and also uh, when we go to container world, right? Uh, most of the times we build our application and parameterize all the configurable properties. Like you may want to run the same container uh, in a different, different environments, be it in a QA environment, staging, prod, different environments, and you may have to uh, parameterize all those inputs. So how do you feed that uh, environment variables? Most of the times you go for environment variables. And then uh, what kind of a provision Kubernetes products? Like there is a, a config map, there is a secrets, so these are the ways that we can feed these environment variables into the containers. So understanding these are a kind of a critical. Um, and I would recommend uh, if you are a newbie to the Kubernetes world, uh, there are uh, tools that you can spin up locally like a Minikube or Kind. Uh, it is kind of uh, easy uh, if you have good enough uh, RAM and uh, uh, you can spin up a cluster and then you can play around and then uh, see uh, uh, one challenge is kind of uh, writing the manifest files. Like when I first started, kind of I got lost in so and so Kubernetes uh, ML files, a lot of uh, labels and names, and labels are at different levels. I kind of uh, got lost. But if you thoroughly try to uh, read and understand, they are kind of uh, nested one in another. Like uh, if you are starting, first you may uh, try to create a manifest file for a pod. And then you see a lot of uh, same kind of tags. And then when you try to write for a deployment, you see almost same thing, but nested inside another uh, uh, object. So it, initially it kind of uh, a bit of overwhelming, but you kind of uh, try to identify the patterns. It's not that complex. And especially coupled with IDEs, with uh, so much of auto completion capabilities, it's fine. You can get uh, habituated to that. Uh, and there are tools which actually generate these manifests. You don't have to manually write them also. But I am kind of a, a skeptic about how uh, good their generated manifests are. But again, you can start generating and then I tweak them. You don't have to use them as it is. You can tweak them. Uh, this is what I would suggest. Run Minikube or kind. And then I would strongly recommend don't go for uh, generation of a manifest beginning. Uh, learn how to write them properly and then deploy and then see. Uh, just if in case uh, anybody is interested, uh, recently, again, I got so much fascinated by Kubernetes and then I wrote uh, almost five, six uh, blog posts. If you are a typical Java Spring Boot guy, uh, person, you can just follow along uh, how to use parts, how to use services, how to use deployments, ingress rules. Uh, I wrote a series of blog posts. Uh, that's a good starting point. Yeah, I think um, beyond that, there are a lot of uh, administration type of uh, activities like nodes. Sure, let's get to the administration other. part a little later. Uh, let's first focus I, on I the am, developer part. I, 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 I am not even familiar with the administration part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think getting to an administration part would be a complex thing. Like and I know how challenging people. it is to like to set up a simple, to get a simple Kubernetes cluster running in my local machine three, four years back was a challenge was a really big challenge <laughs> it was like uh, you needed to configure so many things and you needed a really powerful machine as well and uh, yeah and that's why what i did was actually i started learning kubernetes in the cloud so 
like Kubernetes, uh, like each of the cloud platforms offer Kubernetes service, but the Kubernetes services from AWS and Azure are not free. So they're not part of the free tier. Uh, that's why I chose to go with Google Kubernetes engine, which was like, if you go for a Google free account, it's easy to create and kind of use it. But again, the free tier accounts come with their own limitations as well. So it's, you can, you, you can use the free tier only once. <laughs> So, but uh, like it was a huge challenge to set up a cluster. That was the first challenge I faced when I started with my Kubernetes journey. And you touched upon some of the very, very important concepts in there, right? Uh, I think understanding pods, replica set, deployment service, and what is the role each of them play uh, in a Kubernetes and the importance of labels, because labels are the things which you write in your deployment manifest, like attaching the right labels with your uh, Kubernetes objects like pod, replica set, deployment, and service, and using the right labels in your deployment configuration or the YAML file. A lot of, as you say, like it was a struggle for me as well when I started my journey uh, with understanding the deployment configuration with the YAML, especially. But it's like magic, right? Once you understand it, it's it like a lot of times there are things which are really, really complex, but once you understand them, it becomes a magic. Like you can do so many things using that, that. Uh, one example is like the release strategies, right? By making the deployment configuration, the YAML so complex, you can kind of do variety of releasing release strategies just by playing with the YAML and things like that. That kind of flexibility is what I think, uh, what I love from uh, Kubernetes. Uh, Kaushik, do you yeah, want to the touch upon any is, uh, Please go ahead, Shiva. So I just want to say this label thing is very interesting. Uh, like. Uh, Typically, when we see anything attached a label, that's kind of a not so important. It's like nice to have, maybe, uh, let's say it's a dev environment or what. That's how we feel. But in the Kubernetes world, labels play a very, very crucial role. You, as you said, we get to know how many things we can do. Like uh, you can just tag and then uh, I kind of, I think uh, blue-green deployments and all, many things heavily rely upon these labels. So exactly. yeah, if you are learning Kubernetes, get a good hang on uh, what labels are, how to use them. Absolutely. I actually had a question for you, Ranga. So you, so you talked about uh, the cloud services for Kubernetes with uh, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Uh, is it true that the Google Kubernetes engine is a little closer to the, the core Kubernetes implementation as opposed to... Uh, AWS and Azure, like, are they wrappers, or can you still use the same Kubernetes configuration for, uh, for all the three? Like, you make it cloud agnostic. Yeah, it's ninety nine percent. I would say it's the same. Uh, it's like the same yeah. Kubernetes. Once uh, you are adhering to everything related to Kubernetes, the deployment configurations, how you create the cluster, everything would be the same everywhere. There would be obviously like a little bit of changes that are customized to that specific cloud. But if you just look at the container orchestration part of it, all three mm -hmm. services are essentially the same. Uh, the only difference comes in is the amount of experience Google has with Kubernetes, right? AWS was a little late to the game. They did not want to take Kubernetes at all initially, right? So they, I mean, obviously it's a technology coming from Google Cloud and I don't know, I'm a competitor. So I'm a little reluctant at the start until it really became popular. Azure and like AWS were a little reluctant. So the amount of experience Google Cloud has in managing reliable clusters, uh, Kubernetes clusters, shows in GKE, right? I never had a problem with a GKE cluster at all in like my four or five years of experience playing with it. So yeah, it's it, like I think it's just in the stability that there is a difference between these mm. three. It's not, I, and now I would say even stability is not such a big thing because like each of the cloud platforms have Kubernetes services for at least two to three years now. So. Yeah. Uh, initially, it was a challenge, uh, but now I would say almost all three are stable. And if you want to run Kubernetes, you can go anywhere. And uh, going further, like there are multi-cloud abstractions on top of these as well. So uh, there are abstractions which you can make use of, and you can have clusters which are in like each of the three clouds, uh, and you can manage them from a central location. Google Cloud offers a mm -hmm. service for it. Azure offers a service for it. Uh, AWS offers a service for it. If you don't want to go for any of those, you have OpenShift as well. So yeah, yeah. the underlying infrastructure is almost becoming uh, kind of so standardized that now people are focusing on the layer above. <laughs> yeah. So if, if this is uh, if this works, what is what is a good use case for somebody to go like um, 
like an like a bean stock or like somebody taking elastic bean stock or maybe doing some kind of a, an elaborate uh, cloud formation template, set up all these different services as opposed to doing all things Kubernetes. Like what, what is the factor that would influence some business or some enterprise to go one versus another in your opinion? It's actually, if I have a simple application to deploy, I don't want the complexity of Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes comes mm. with a lot of uh, need. I mean, in terms of understanding the clusters, uh, running clusters efficiently, because you are deploying containers, you'd want to make sure that every node is completely utilized. So there are a lot of factors which are involved in running a cluster efficiently. And also in terms mm. of the de developer knowledge, which is needed. It's like, uh, the step up is too high. Like once you do the step up, it's easy. But the step up is not easy. So those are the two factors I see in like uh, in staying away from Kubernetes when you have simpler problems. And if you just okay. have a simple web application to run, uh, and if it's independent of everything else, why do I need to make it part of a huge ecosystem? Right. I can actually rather have something simple to run it. Yeah, I think uh, Beanstalk is a AWS attempt of uh, providing fast kind of a, a, a mm. approach. You don't care about uh, how things work under the hood. You just tell me where is your container and what you need, and I'll take care of the uh, infra form. Uh, but that is, as Ranga said, that is sufficient for uh, simpler applications. But uh, if you are building a lot, lot of applications and the complexity is more, uh, maybe uh, it is, uh, it is, it justifies the complexity of uh, adopting Kubernetes. But yeah. for simpler applications. Yeah. Beanstalk or any fast platform is Yeah, Beanstalk is just one of the uh, possibilities, right? So a lot of these cloud providers have, uh, you know, auto scaling technology, and you don't have to use Kubernetes for it. So uh, that, that's a fair point. If all if all you're looking for is a very static kind of an auto scaling strategy, which is you know simple, then there's there's a there's a cutoff at some point. You're gonna go well. There's not gonna work and switch to Kubernetes. But um, until you hit that point. It's better to go with a you know a native auto scaling technology provided by a cloud provider, and then once it becomes too big, that's when you know organizations say, well, now we have to go the Kubernetes route. That makes sense. Yeah, and also like if you're in the container world and if you'd want to be able to run containers efficiently, like there's a wrapper on top of Kubernetes which is Knative, uh, which also allows you to run containers in a serverless way on Kubernetes kind of infrastructure. So that's also another thing which people can explore as a intermediate step. If you don't want to go to Kubernetes directly, probably you can make use of some of the Knative implementations. Like in Google Cloud, mm -hmm. there is something called Cloud Run. Um, AWS also offers uh, like its own container orchestration solution, ECS, and there's a serverless version of it also called Fargate. So those are options. Like Azure also offers something called Azure Container Instances. So they have options as an intermediate thing before they would take the full jump in.